All right. Hi, everybody. So this is going to be basically your introduction on what Blood Bank is and what are our founding principles within immunohematology. And that goes back to immunology and the basics that you got back then, which maybe confused you and maybe you don't even get now. Um, I know when I took it, I, I had to see ELISA technique over and over again before I really truly understood it and it really stuck in my head. So each of these uh, lectures are led with objectives for you. This is going to help you make your outlines and make sure that you get um, every term that you need and the basics of each chapter. Um, I know in my announcement I posted a, a quick little update on, on how to uh, make a, an outline. So what we're going to look at tonight is what are antigens, what are immunogens, epitopes, and antigenic determinants. We're going to look at what antigens actually are, what are, what are they like on the red cells, white cells, and platelets. And then we're going to look at the immunoglobulin molecule and um, the components of that immunoglobulin chain um, to make sure that you truly have that basis. Because all of the principles in immunohematology, and I'm going to call it blood bank from now on just because it's a lot easier um, to pronounce, um, but all of these are really, really basic immunology principles that you need to make sure you have a good handle on. Um, if you are looking for extra reading um, and maybe you have a few dollars in your budget, um, grab a used copy of the old Stevens um, principles um, of immunology and uh, serologic detection. Um, it's very helpful. It's my favorite book. Um, it's very boring. It's black and white, no pictures. Well, pictures, but they're black and white pictures. But it reads the best out of all of the textbooks that I've, I've read in, in my med lab science career. Um, we're also going to look at um, IgM and IgG antibodies, um, what their structure is, how they differ from each other, um, your primary and secondary immune responses, um, how we look at cellular immunity, our antibody response time, and how that process works, and what are the properties of uh, antibody binding. Um, so your antigen-antibody combination um, to uh, produce your agglutination. Um, the major immunology testing is um, typically done by precipitation, um, agglutination, labeled immunoassays, or molecular detection at this point. Um, so we're going to really focus on agglutination because that's our macroscopic detection. So that's what we're really looking for in our blood banking test. Um, we want to take a look at the variables, um, how we grade things, um, and the complement pathways, and I know you love those. Um, I have on my YouTube channel, um, so all the videos I posted uh, are um, from my YouTube channel. I do have um, some assignments that I've done for students in the past um, where they've had to kind of act out the complement cascades. Um, makes it a little easier to learn, um, and it's fun, and they look like goofballs. Um, so take a peek at that um, if you're interested. Um, and then we're going to look at, you know, some of our um, effects when we're trying to clear um, our, our red cells um, and how we look at complement in there. Um, what are is hemolysis within agglutination reactions and why it, we are concerned about it. Um, and then how our immune response um, occurs um, and how we can see variations within our in vivo responses. So when we go back um, to the basics, um, antigens are basically molecules um, that bind to our antibodies or T-cell receptors. So essentially, um, we can have different types of antigens, but the most common one that you are um, used to thinking about, at least in, in blood terms, is the antigen on top of the red cell. All right, so I actually liken it to, I, I live in an area where it's called Hemlock Point. We have a lot of trees, okay? So I liken my antigens to a hemlock tree. So this tree here that just disappeared is basically a protein or carbohydrate structure on top of the red cell. Um, and it's part of, it, it actually inserts itself into 
um, the cell membrane. Let's make it a biconcave disc, right? Um, looks like a cherry. Um, so it inserts itself into the membrane, um, and it basically tells us what is on it. So the typical ones that you, we're going to talk about as, as we get further on are things like your um, ABO antigens. So this is your typical blood type. So your A, B, or O, and then A, B. And we'll get more into that when we actually talk about our ABO antigens. Um, and I'll describe that um, your, your H is actually like a pedestal, um, similar to the Statue of Liberty. Now, I'm not an artist, especially with a computer mouse, but here's the Statue of Liberty, right, on Ellis Island. Um, and then you have your little statue and your pedestal, and she's got the flame and then her crown. Yeah, I'm not sure what that looks like, but here's your pedestal, right? So this here is your H antigen. So, and then this here would be your A or your, oops, your B antigen, right? So this H antigen, this pedestal is the basis of your ABO system. So you don't have A or B if you don't have this pedestal here, okay? You won't have a blood type without that. Um, unless you're Bombay phenotype, but we will talk about that much later um, within the course. It's actually rather fascinating. Um, so for just the main, the basic classification of antigens, we have your allogeneic antigens. So these are non-self. So these are things that we recognize as not part of us. Our immune system is programmed to immunoedit. Um, so we are really good at not responding to autologous antigens or our self antigens. So these type of cells, like for example, your T cells, um, most of the T cells that um, mature within the thymus actually are deleted out um, by programmed cell death or apoptosis because they actually recognize self a as a foreign entity. So they're not able to turn that off switch on. Anything in your body needs an on off switch, no matter what we're talking about. You can't just have everything on all the time. It doesn't work like that. Um, you have a lot of problems that come after that. So our, our ability to identify self as self is key. And we often see that crumbling in autoimmune disorders and autoantibodies. So we'll, we'll talk about that later when we start talking about antibody detection. So when we look at haptins, these are antigens that require a carrier molecule to elicit an immune response. So this one here is an example is medication, but a very simple example is um, the poison ivy. Um, so typically speaking in poison ivy, you need a carrier molecule initially. So basically you have the oil that you're exposed to. And I'm not sure if you guys have a lot of poison ivy, but we are inundated with it um, down here. Um, and my family is incredibly allergic to it. My husband needs steroids every time he like looks at it, basically. Um, so basically what happens is you're exposed to the oil on the leaves. It binds to a protein within your skin and you absorb it. So that protein on the skin um, acts as a carrier molecule for that oil, which is actually a haptid, um, and then the immune response elicits. But the, the thing about that is once the immune response occurs, we don't need that carrier molecule anymore. And that's why you see um, faster and more exacerbated reactions as you get exposed to the poison ivy afterwards. Um, so we also have things called um, antigenic determinants or epitopes. So antigens will actually have multiple um, determinant sites um, to be able to elicit different types of antibody responses. And you typically see, and uh, let me move to the next slide, um, and we'll, I'll, I will elaborate a little further on the structure of an antibody in a minute. Um, so when we're looking at transfusion service, so most of our reactions that we're looking at are humoral and they're involving B lymphocytes. So our plasma cells, um, our B cells that produce our antibodies and our memory cells um, are the cells that kind of hang around to respond later. So initially what happens is our B lymphocytes will recognize an antigen. By the way, let's not um, ignore the fact that T lymphs are really impor important here because the reason that these guys can do this um, is that our T lymphs 
are basically presenting it to the cell. They're called antigen presenting cells. Now we do have um, some other mon monos macrophages that are also act as um, maybe dendritic cells. They act as um, antigen presenting cells. Um, but these um, cells will present that antigen to the B lymphs um, and they will either trigger the B cell to produce a plasma cell, which are my absolute favorite cells. They're beautiful. Um, they look like a purple fried egg with a nucleus um, in your area of clearing um, your Golgi apparatus. Um, so hopefully you got to see some of those in hematology because um, they're beautiful. Um, and then they can also elicit a memory cell. So they'll respond again without the activation of T cells the next time around. Um, so we remember it. So when we look at things um, and we look at properties of the antigen, we look at immunogenicity um, and things that can actually um, contribute to that. So the first thing is our proteins are the best thing, way to do it, okay? Um, they're larger, they're more complex, so we can actually see them. Um, a little better, our, our, our antibody response can be better because we can respond to more. Um, and then we can see complex carbohydrates um, being just as good an immunogen, or basically um, the immunogen is basically how we elicit an immune response. Um, the degree of foreignness. So basically, we need to be able to identify it as non-self, okay? And the bigger the difference, the better we can have an immune response. Um, and as you can imagine, this is a big immunogen. So the larger mo molecular weight or the larger the, the molecule is, the better um, immune response it will elicit. Um, dosage, this is going to be something that comes um, again, um, and you will probably be scared of it. Um, dosage is actually really simple, um, but... Um, we will talk about this more when we're talking about antibody identification. Um, but here, um, the dosage responds to the number of red cells that were introduced and the amount of antigen that they carry. Um, so when we look at dosage, um, for example, some blood groups um, will elicit a higher immune response if they show dosage. And that means, so typically, you know that when we in, um, ignore that little red cell, we'll take care of it later. Um, but for example, we'll say the Duffy A, Duffy B, okay? All right, so we typically inherit one or both, okay? So, but if we have Duffy A positive and Duffy B negative, what ends up happening is we will show, whoops, sorry about that, the red cell having a double dose of the Duffy A antigen than the Duffy B. So you'll have more antigen than, say, an A and a B. So the more we see, okay, with that double dose of A, the more we see, the higher response we will get. Um, and we'll, don't worry, we'll talk, if you don't understand that, we will talk more about that. Um, and then again, um, routes of administration. So how did we see the antigens? Um, is it intramuscular? Is it intravenous? Um, do we eat it? Um, so typically, IM or intravenous injections are better routes for eliciting an immune response. Now remember, in blood banking, we don't want to elicit an immune response. Eliciting an immune response in blood bank is bad, okay? Because we don't want to create a transfusion reaction. So our antibodies, um, when we look on the other end, we talked about antigens, okay? So um, these are our little antigens, all right? These are like our little lock and key shapes here. Um, so these antibodies are glycoproteins. So they have your polypeptide trains, um, and there's four of them. They're joined by disulfide bonds. So you have two heavy chains, two light chains. So they usually show it by two heavy, two lights, and in a Y shape. But in actuality, they're like a barrel, and they trap the antigen inside the barrel. It's actually really cool. Um, but it's a lot easier to look at it when it looks like this, isn't it? Um, so our heavy chains are, um, and then light chains. So our light chains will be kappa, kappa or lambda chains. And our constant region or our heavy chains, which is this bigger one, okay, um, 
will determine our antibody class. So we have IgG, IgA, IgM, IgD, and IgE. Hopefully this is a review. Hopefully this isn't anything new. Um, and our variable region is our light and heavy chains, and these will bind the antigen. And these is this is the hinge region here, so it allows these guys to freely move and bind with other antigen. So our IgG and our IgM antibodies are what we look at in blood banking. And um, this chart is really good to show you the difference. Um, but one of the things that we really need to pay close attention to is immediate spin and antiglobulin phase. Okay, so this means this is going to come up first. Okay, so typically our ABO antigens are our IgM in nature. Um, and these will come up in our immediate spin reactions. And we can, in an antibody screen, um, detect IgM. Uh, molecules um, or antibodies as well. Um, our IgG will come up in our uh, antiglobulin test or we'll carry it all the way out. These will act um, at 37 degrees um, Celsius where IgM is room temperature. Um, so this is the first responder. This comes right afterwards. IgM cannot cross the placenta. So typically speaking, um, uh, if we find them um, in a newborn, um, the babies have made them on their own, uh, but they don't do this till maybe six months of age or older, um, which is the reason why we don't do back types um, on babies, but I'll explain what that is later. Um, and our IgGs can um, cross the placenta. So this is the idea of um, you know, the baby um, has at least a little bit of an immune system when it's first born because it has the mom's IgG antibodies um, that protect them. So when we look at immune responses, so our primary response occurs when we first get exposed, um, and it typically happens within five to 10 days. Um, IgM comes first, IgG next, um, and we don't have as much antibody um, because it takes a little time. Our body has to see it and then present it then manufacture antibodies, and then make our memory cells. Our secondary response happens after we've been exposed to it again. This will occur within one to three days, so as you can see, it's a little shorter. Why? Because we still have memory cells. Um, they're mostly IgG, because these are what are going to be presented um, or produced by the um, plasma cells um, that result from memory cell uh, reactivation. Um, and we'll have small amounts of IgM as well. Um, our antibody levels are high um, and they'll be sustained for a longer time. So we care about this in blood banking because we really wanna make sure um, that if a patient has an antibody or elicits this first primary response, um, if we need to transfuse that patient, we need to make sure we screen units to be antigen negative, okay? Because we don't wanna show them what they've been exposed to and make them elicit a secondary response because what will end up happening is this antibody um, content um, will be greater um, and then will elicit more of an immune response and this is where we can start seeing um, bigger uh, immune um, system problems and bigger rejection. Um, when we look at antibody antigen reactions we have that immune complex and this is basically where antigen and antibody combine. And this strength of binding is dependent on how big the antigen is, what it, how, how it's shaped, and what the charge is. Um, and these are held together um, by non-covalent bonds or forces, and these contribute to the avidity or strength of the attachment. Um, affinity is the strength of attraction, if you will. Um, so what will force an antigen to bind to an antibody? You got your ionic bonding, um, and this is basically where we're looking at um, molecules being attracted together because they have opposite charge. Um, so the positive charge region is attracted to the negative um, of another molecule. Um, we also have hydrogen bonding um, where two negatively charged groups um, are attracted to uh, because of that um, hydrogen atom. We can see hydrog hydrophobic bonding. Um, where we have some weak bonds that will arise um, because they'll exclude water from that complex. And then your van der Waals forces, and I know you've heard this before, um, where we have that electron cloud of one atom and the protons of another um, atom, and they become attracted to one another. 
So our red cell antigens and antibodies, so our antigens are on the red cell um, as a part of the membrane, so the glycoprotein or glycolipids, um, and they will glutenate with antibodies, and some can elicit a stronger immune response than um, others. So D antigen um, is really immunogenic, um, and that's why we include it as part of the blood type and are part of our initial screening, and we will only um, transfuse um, RH compatible units um, in women of childbearing age because we don't want them to produce an anti-D, which they will upon a first exposure. And we'll also talk about Rogam later on how that um, helps to improve that. Um, when we look at antibodies, these are molecules um, floating around in the plasma or serum. They're made by, again, those plasma cells. Um, IgG antibodies are clinically significant. They react at 37 degrees. Um, IgM react at room temperature and are usually not considered significant unless they can activate complement like our ABO antibodies. Sometimes we can see an IgM causing a problem with hemolytic disease of the newborn, um, but typically speaking, it's so rare because it doesn't cross the placenta that we don't usually see that. So when we look at reaction type, our in vivo reactions, um, this will basically um, occur when we have foreign antigens um, that we're exposed to during transfusion or pregnancy. Um, and now remember, we're talking about reactions um, blood bank wise, not like say an allergic reaction. Um, so we're exposed to these foreign antigens. Um, so basically foreign red cells, um, either by a donor transfusion or a pregnancy, um, and that we get exposed to fetal blood um, for a pregnant mom, um, we will produce alloantibodies. Um, and again, this is an antibody against an antigen from someone else. Um, so we do an antibody screen test, also known as an indirect antiglobulin test. Um, this will detect alloantibodies. So we will always do this um, as part of a type and screen before we transfuse a patient. Make sure that we catch um, any um, in vivo formation of antibodies um, from a transfusion to prevent that from happening. Um, we can also see antibodies that um, activate complement proteins that can cause um, red cell destruction. The common endpoint um, in all three of the um, complement cascades, so if you remember, um, it's the classic alternative and the mannose binding lectin pathway, um, is the MAC attack or the MAC complex, um, where you have C5, 6, 7, 8, and 9, which are your complement um, proteins um, that create a pore. Um, in the target cell um, that basically causes um, lysis. So we obviously don't want to have that um, occur if it's our red cells. Um, and this can also um, attack foreign red cells, which will destroy the transfused um, red cells, which is also um, not um, a good reaction to have. So our complement, um, these proteins will enhance um, immunologic um, processes once we activate them. Um, and I already told you, I have a bad habit of talking ahead of the PowerPoint. Um, but our membrane attack complex or our MAC attack, that's my kid's name, so it's easy for me to remember. Um, this MAC attack will um, lyse the cells. Um, and again, it, this is actually um, incorrect. So the two pathways that we really care about in blood bank is our classical and alternative, but we also have a mannose binding um, lectin, um, but this requires a bacterial cell surface. So um, this is just an example of your alternative, your classic, and then the mannose binding lectin will pop in um, over here. Um, so why do we have complement proteins? Um, so the major things are opsonization, anaphylaxis, lysis, and chemotactic. And basically, we want to get this foreign crap out. We want to get rid of the complex. We want to enhance phagocytosis. We want to promote our enzymes um, being released from our neutrophils um, um, to kill um, our bacteria. We want to uh, increase smooth muscle contract, um, contraction and inflammation um, to basically localize our immune response. We want to kill our foreign antigens and recruit platelets and phagocytes, um, which will often be our, our monos, our macros, our newts. Um, these have our phagocytic capability. 
So when we look at reactions in the blood bank, um, most of our reactions are agglutination reactions, or our anti antigen antibody reactions that occur within our test tubes or solid phase capture or gel technology um, to look for visible agglutination. So negative reactions will indicate a lack of agglutination. So it's basically our red cells just kind of float next to each other and they don't connect. Um, so the first thing um, when we look at steps, because this is basically what our agglutination is going to look like. Okay, here's our antibody and it's binding cells together. Okay, and it's forming this clump that can be detected um, visually. So first we have our sensitization where our antibody will bind to antigen, uh, but we won't have any visible agglutination. Um, second, we have a lattice formation where our coated cells will cross-link to form that visible agglutination step. So what can affect agglutination? So temperature, incubation time, pH, ionic strength, and our lattice formation, or basically our zeta potential or zone of equivalence, centrifugation. So when we look at sensitization, um, remember IgG likes our 37 degrees Celsius, IgM likes room temp. Um, for incubation, we'll look at immediate spin um, or after in room temperature or 37 degrees Celsius, okay? Because this is going to only, these are only going to react um, when they've been allowed to react at 37 degrees Celsius and anti-human globulin is added later. Um, 7.0 physiologic pH is the best um, reaction. Um, pH and our ionic strength uh, will also affect um, the binding potential. Um, and we can again use um, some reagents. Our LIS or our low ionic strength solution is really good at reducing that um, distance between cells and allowing them to get a little closer to agglutinate. Uh, but we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about reagents. Um, so when we look at how what affects the lattice formation, um, how far the cells are apart um, is caused by our charged ions, um, and that will actually be determined by our zeta potential. Um, and we also need good equal antigen antibody con uh, con concentrations um, to create a zone of equivalence. And our time and speed of centrifugation to build, bring the cells closer together. Um, so we need to have them at optimum temps, optimum pH and as close together as we can get them for a good antigen antibody complex um, to form. So when we grade agglutination reactions, we'll start with a negative down here. It's basically there's no chunks of cells at all. It's a nice smooth flag coming off the button because first what you want to do is you want to tilt and swirl. Hold on, gotta let this go. Tilt. All right, and then this button, you want to tilt it so it just kind of swirls off. You want to see that tail come off. You want to not see any, like, random chunks within it. If you see chunks and they kind of hang around, that's going to most likely be a one-plus reaction. We have medium and small-sized agglutinates, or chunks, if you will. <laughs> um, and the background is turbid with a lot of free cells. Um, two plus is you have a lot of medium sized agglutinates, but the background here is clear. Um, and then three plus is you have a couple large agglutinates and again, a clear background. And then our four plus is our single um, solid agglutinate. So it looks like the cell button, but when you let it go, it kind of like flies like a flag um, and it comes off the tube bottom. So one of the things that we have to be careful um, about in blood banking is hemolysis. So hemolysis indicates an antibody antigen reaction. It's usually caused by complement activation. Um, the red cell button will be a little smaller um, and we'll have a pink to red supernatant um, after centrifugation. Um, we need to use non-hemolyzed samples, okay? This is the main reason because basically the endpoint of agglutination can be hemolysis. So we want to make sure that we're not using something that's already hemolyzed because how are we going to tell? We're not going to. So always reject um, a hemolyzed sample um, for um, antibody detection. So anticoagulants that prevent complement um, activation 
um, can also be um, utilized because um, these guys will chelate calcium. So what's our routine testing? So um, we use reagents to look for antigen antibody reactions. Um, so these will appear as agglutination or hemolysis. So our testing um, for these uh, reactions are either tube, um, gel technology, and solid face capture uh, technology. And I've had um, the privilege to use all three. Um, this one's my favorite, by the way. The solid face capture is really cool. Um, so I have a bunch of PowerPoints for you guys to take a look at later on when we start talking about automation. So our routine testing um, will look for our antigen and antibody combination and agglutination. So our antigens will be our reagent red cells. So these are usually commercially prepared and we have known antigens and these are listed in an antigram. Um, and they look like pluses and, and zeros. Um, we'll talk more about them because they can be really confusing. Um, our patient or donor red cells um, are usually an unknown source of antigen. So we will test these with commercial anti-sera to look for um, antigen identity. When we look at sources of antibody, so we use our reagent anti-sera. So anti means against, remember. Um, these are commercially prepared and they're a known source of antibody. So typical thing, anti-A, anti-B, anti-D. So we're looking for the corresponding antigens. So anti-A is looking for the A antigen. Anti-B is looking for the what? Oh yeah, the B antigen. You get it. Um, and then the patient or donor serum or plasma is usually our unknown antibody, unless we have a frequent flyer and we know they have antibodies. Um, so typically um, our serum or plasma is tested with commercial red cells, and this will determine the identity of the antibody or antibodies. So we will have a reagent um, screen cell. So this will be typically um, like a two or three cell screen um, looking for um, an antibody to red cell antigens. So these um, screen cells will have known antigrams on their cells, so we know what's on them. So our routine um, testing is your ABO. Um, so A, B, O, and D typing. This is considered our forward grouping. So this is where we're looking at a, looking for A, B, and D antigen. So the and you'll see when I describe in the reagents lecture the patient's red cells or as my former students say, the red shit, um, um, is our patient cells. And the source of antibody here is the clear shit, um, which is, well, technically this is clear and colored because anti-A is blue and anti-B is, is uh, yellow and anti-D is clear. But this is a clear liquid um, that has the antibodies against the corresponding antigens. Our ABO serum testing is a, considered our reverse. So we always do a forward and a reverse type. So our reverse group looks for ABO antibodies in the patient. So our source of antigens are reagent red cells. So usually our A1 and B cells. And we use patient serum or plasma to look for these unknown antibodies. So typically speaking, um, patients um, will develop ABO um, antibodies. Um, upon exposure of, say, like a, you know, a virus or something that looks like it. So, for example, I'm a neg. I have naturally occurring anti-B. I've been exposed to something that looks like the B antigen, and I have formed antibody against the B antigen. So I know that that is foreign. Um, this does not work for D-typing. Um, D is um, very immunogenic, um, and typically speaking, nothing that we see looks like it except the D antigen. So if we do form anti-D, we've formed it for a reason. We've been exposed during pregnancy or we've been exposed during a transfusion. Um, antibody identification and antibody screen are done with cells um, that have specific antigrams. So we'll do the screen first. Um, and this is looking for antibodies to red cell antigens. And um, we'll use the patient serum or plasma. If this comes up positive, we'll run a panel. Um, and basically this panel is an 11 to 16 cell panel. Um, and each of the cells has a different mosaic of antigens on it um, that are known. And we can investigate um, and find out what um, antibody the patient has. 
Um, Cross-matching will look at the compatibility between donor and patient um, plasma. So we'll use donor red cells and patient serum or plasma. So typically speaking, we'll do an electronic or immediate spin cross-match. So an electronic cross-match is only good if um, the patient has um, a history of no antibodies. It has two types on file. We can just scan the unit and it'll just electronically do it. Um, otherwise, we can do an immediate spin cross match, which is basically a drop of patient serum and a drop of patient of donor cell suspension, mix it up, centrifuge it, look for agglutination. Um, we'll do this um, if there's no antibody history. If there's an antibody history, we have to carry it all the way out to the um, AHG phase, which we'll talk about later. Um, so these are blood bank testing in a nutshell, um, there are more tests that we will talk about later, but these are our routine tests that we do every day. Um, so stay tuned for the reagents.